Good evening, everyone. Well, we're running a little bit late, so I will give you the gist of the matter and then go slower when it gets to the current points. So if I skip a couple of things, bear with me. I'm not going to let any, leave anything out. I'm not just a normal Christian or an ordinary Christian. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And that means that we have a very particular message. And that message is called the Three Angels' Messages. And we are to allow nothing else to occupy our minds. Because within those Three Angels' Messages, you have every single component that you can imagine. You have all the issues of the gospel. Worship him who made. You have the hour of his judgment. That's law, standard. All of those issues. You have Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Separating falsehood from truth. And you have righteousness in verity. And do not accept the mark of the beast. You have all the aspects of the gospel because that angel that was flying in the midst of heaven had the everlasting gospel to proclaim. One of the features of this church is that it has been preaching for a very, very long time now that there will be legislation which elevates the first beast to a position of religious prominence and worship. Is that correct? And by definition, the first beast is the same as the little horn. And we don't have to speak euphemistically. It's the papacy. I'm being naughty. All the reformers said it was the papacy, and they had good reason to say it. And all the doctrines that we have regarding this have already been expounded by the, by the reformers, including the De Year principle, which was believed by all the reformers, the Lutheran reformers, until they signed a concordat and no longer wished to believe it. But just because someone doesn't wish to believe something doesn't make it incorrect. If it's biblical, it stays biblical whether we like to believe it or not. Now we've been preaching that there will be enacted a law which makes void God's law. And that we will come before a choice where we have to choose between the observance of the seventh day Sabbath, as it is in the Bible, or Sunday, which Rome claims to be its mark of ecclesiastical power. And that, of course, affects righteousness. What is righteousness in its simplest definition? Doing what is right. <laughs> Simple, eh? It's not so complicated. And the ultimate righteousness is embodied in a person. And who is that? That's Jesus Christ. And by choosing to obey him, I have, in actual fact, embodied his righteousness. Is that not right? So righteousness by faith is being covered by the perfect cloak of his righteousness, which enables and empowers me to be obedient to all the precepts of God. It's nothing that makes me great. It only makes him great. Now, we've been preaching for 120 years, and 
far beyond that by now, that this is going to happen and everybody keeps on saying it's more and more unlikely that it will happen. Well, I've titled this lecture, I Hear the Rumbling, and I'm going to just give you a very quick typology. We're going to skip a lot, a lot of these verses because of time. But I want to start with the King Hezekiah because he was the one that still tried to fortify and build Jerusalem and do what is right. And we're going to work towards the fall of Babylon. Now Hezekiah tried his best to stem the tide of apostasy in Judah and the testimony of the Lord about him was and thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and truth before his God. Hezekiah built the tunnel, Hezekiah fortified the walls, he built the towers and all of these are symbolic of what has to happen in the reconstruction of the gospel message. In other words, the gospel message will be reconstructed also in the end, end of time. And this is symbolic of what this church's program should be. Now we all know what happened then. Hezekiah was confronted by the Syrian king. But he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, and there was no king like him in Judah, says the Bible. And when the Syrian king Sennacherib came with his 185,000 people, God promised him that this king would have no power over him. Is there a typology in this? Yes. If we have fortified the walls surrounding ourselves and our faith, and if we have built the towers and we are watchful, the king will have no power over us. And God will send his angels to protect him, just as when he wiped out 185,000 Assyrians. Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed, for the king of Assyria nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. This is very encouraging. This is a typology for the end of time. Now, unfortunately, after this great victory which was wrought by God, Hezekiah, he was slightly uplifted like, like Nebuchadnezzar was. And... Uh, he received tribute and honor and glory. And eventually, one day, one of the enemies of Assyria was Babylon, a rising power that the Assyrians didn't want to come into ascendancy. And these people sent a delegation. Be careful of these little horn powers that rise to prominence and sent a delegation to Hezekiah, and Hezekiah said, come, let me show you everything that I have. You know the story, right? The Bible says he showed him all that was in his house, everything. There was nothing that he didn't show him. And then the prophet Isaiah in 2 King goes and rebukes him for what he did. And he said, the time is coming when everything will be carried away. And I will talk about those issues later. There's also a typology there. Now Hezekiah slept with his fathers and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. The next king is now Manasseh. But Manasseh should never have been born. He shouldn't have been there. Because Manasseh, according to the Bible, was 12 years old when he began to reign. And Hezekiah, when at the point of death, pleaded with God 
Remember that the prophet Isaiah went back to him and his life was extended by 15 years and there was the miracle of the sun going back 10 degrees and all of those issues? Now, if his life was extended by 15 years and Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, that means he was born three years into that extension. He shouldn't have existed. God wanted to spare us the Manassehs of this world, but uh, he doesn't hold his foreknowledge against us at any stage. What a magnificent God we serve. And so the repentant cry of Hezekiah was heard and we had a Manasseh. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and I'm not going to go into all the details. He built the high places. He was a disgusting king. And he slaughtered the prophets of the Most High, even the wonderful Isaiah. He had him sawn in half. Can you imagine that? Because he rebuked him. So I'm going to skip through all of this. He caused the children to go through the fire. The spirit of prophecy and prophet of kings tells us that Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, quoting two kings. And the first to fall was Isaiah, who for over half a century had stood before Judah. His father had listened to him and this man murders him. What does this tell us about the character of God? Eventually the Assyrians came and took him captive and led him away with hooks in the nose and fetters of bronze and pulled him with hooks through the nose all the way to their capital city. What a swollen nose he must have had. And there in his jail, in his prison, he comes to repentance. And God hears him and puts him back on his throne. What kind of God do we serve? He had cut Isaiah in half. He'd killed all those who stood for righteousness. And God enthrones him again. And he tries to reverse what he did, but the nation had become rotten. You know, if we preach apostasy long enough, the rot sets in. And even if we try to reform, it is hard to remove the rot. There's a message in that. So I'm going to skip all this repentance here and the prophets warned and then Manasseh slept with his father and his son Ammon reigned but he was evil so evil that the people couldn't handle it and they conspired against him and killed him what an interesting story and here it says in 2 Kings, the servants of Ammon conspired against him and slew the king in his own house. And the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. And what a magnificent king. Here is a young king and he restores everything. There will be a revival of primitive godliness amongst us just before the fall. But it will not affect everyone because the rot, when it sets in, is horrendous. Second Kings 22, Because thy heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants, etc., well, we know the story. He was a wonderful king. He broke down all the high places. He totally banned contemplative prayer. He said, get rid of it. We don't want any contemplative prayer. He says, we want none of this stuff. No spiritual formation. Away with it. But he died. He had been promised he would die in peace, but he died in battle because he wouldn't listen 
when he was told not to interfere because the king of Egypt had come to assist the Assyrians against the rise of Babylon. And uh, he interfered. And God had a plan. So, anyway, I'm going to skip that little piece. It's rather interesting. In this time, there was also the prophetess, Hulda. Think typology. Ting, 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 ting. We'll leave it there. We don't have time. So Josiah's reforms raised the level of spirituality for some. The Passover was held again, but the young king would not heed the voice of God. And Pharaoh Necho came. So the next king after him is Joachim. In his day, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. So now we have a king of Judah who's a vassal. <laughs> to whom? To the king of Babylon. Is it possible that we could also have some vassals <laughs> to the king of Babylon and say, where's the Charter Ecumenica? Can I assign it for you, please? <laughs> could just happen. And then he turned and rebelled against him, and the Lord sent against him the bands of Chaldees, and etc., etc., etc. And he was evil, and we read in Prophets of Kings what happens. And early in the reign of Joachim, Nebuchadnezzar came for the first time and besieged Jerusalem. So there was a first siege. I'm working towards the end times. Be patient with me. And he took a few captives and he took them away. Daniel was taken and uh, they were scattered. So God's people are scattered throughout the world. This is the type, the anti-type will follow. All right, judgments were beginning to fall. Eventually the prophet Jeremiah proclaimed, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not heard my words, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, said the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. And I'll take the voice of mirth and gladness and the voice of the bridegroom. It'll be over. So there's a clash coming. The next king that rules after Joachim slept with his fathers is Joachim. His son reigned. And the king of Egypt came not again into the land and Joachim was 18 years old when he began to reign and his mother's name is given. Oh, great detail. The Bible is so explicit. And it's amazing that these names were only in the Bible until they were found in the archaeology. So you can trust this. This really happened. And he did what was evil. And so Nebuchadnezzar the king came and he besieged the place again. And Joachim the king of Judah went out to the king of Babylon. So this is not a literal siege as before. The first one he besieged it and took captives. Now the king comes out to him. He doesn't have to do anything. And he sort of, you know, surrenders himself. Fascinating. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, etc. And then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, his father's brother's king in his stead and he changed his name to Zedekiah so we had a good Zedekiah and this will be a bad Zedekiah and he rebelled against the king and the chief priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which had he had hallowed in Jerusalem so just before 
the end, there is a pollution in God's city. It's interesting, if you study the Exodus, I might do that lecture as well. I'll do it right at the end so I can get on a plane and get away. <laughs> God's people encountered a Baal Peor experience. The greatest apostasy that we can imagine and the mingling with Babylon came right on the borders of Canaan. What a typology. Don't think we're so great. We're in trouble. In any case, finally, Nebuchadnezzar came and he besieged with siege ramps for the second time this city. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, and he and all his hosts against Jerusalem pitched against it, and they built forts against it and round about. So there were many sieges of Jerusalem, but prophetically two of them stand out. The first siege, when he takes the captives, and this siege, which leads to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he burns the city and he raises the temple and it's gone. And he slew the sons of Zedekiah. There's a typology here. Before his eyes and he put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and he carried him to Babylon. And then it tells us exactly when this king destroyed the city. Fine, two sieges. Let's jump in history and we go to the fall of Jerusalem under the Romans. And they fell finally in 70 AD. Now there were other sieges after that and uh, Hadrian destroyed it in 135. Even a greater destruction than this one. But prophetically, there are two sieges that are of significance. There were two sieges of significance in the Babylonian time. And now, in the Roman time, we have two sieges. We read about it in the spirit of prophecy. That in the second siege, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Why not? Because Christ had given them warning. And all who believed his words watched for the promised sign. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. After the Romans, under Cestius, first siege, surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. So he received a text message, and for some reason he pulled up his tent stakes and off he went. And the Jews thought, this is great, and they hounded him from behind. And they nearly obliterated his army from behind. So you can imagine that the Romans were not too chuffed. And it took three and a half years before they finally came back under the general Titus. You know the history? And a second siege commenced. If you were in that city during the second siege, what happened to you? You were gone. So the space of time to get out was between the first and the second siege. That was three and a half years. That could be prophetic, right? <laughs> All right, I'm not going to go. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Upon the retreat of Cestius, the Jews, sallying from Jerusalem, 
pursued after the retiring army, and now they were back. Terrible were the calamities that fell upon Jerusalem when the siege was resumed by Titus. The city was invested at the time of the Passover when millions of Jews were assembled in its walls. So there might have been a lot of food for a lot of time, but it was Passover, and so there were millions of people, and you know, it was different. So fierce were the pangs of hunger that men gnawed the leather of their belts. They sacrificed their children. They ate their children. It was a horrendous situation, a type of what will happen at the end of time. Thousands perished from famine and pestilence. Natural affections seemed to have been destroyed. Husbands robbed their wives, wives their husbands. Children could be seen snatching food from the mouths of their parents and all of these things. But the Christians were safe. Eusebius writes, Then the spiritual seed that's a very interesting statement. Not the literal seed. The spiritual seed of Abraham fled to Pella on the other side of the Jordan where they found a safe place of refuge and could serve their master and keep his Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? Pella. We went to visit the place. This is what's left of it. And uh, here they found rest. And it's fascinating that archaeology has revealed that the Sabbath was kept unto the 4th century in Pella. In other words, if Jesus had ever changed the Sabbath, the Christians that fled, owing to his advice, knew nothing about it. Nothing about it. Matthew 24, 15 and 16. When you therefore shall see the Obama nation of desolation, <laughs> spoken of is it, is it my African trans accent or is something wrong here? Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a troublemaker, and I always like to compare new translations with old translations. Uh, please excuse me. If you have a red-letter version, you know the red letter version where the words of Christ are always in red? Then in the King James Version, this whole verse is in red. But if you read an NIV, then spoken of by the prophet Daniel is gone. It's in black. It's there, but it's written in black. Jesus never said it. By implication, someone else added it. You know, they're so sneaky. Or maybe I'm just a conspiracist, I don't know. Let them flee into the mountains. Matthew 24, then let those flee into the mountains. And Luke, and when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is near. Now what is this holy place? What is this holy place? Well, it wasn't the second chamber of the temple, right? Couldn't have been the second chamber of the temple because they were outside the walls of Jerusalem. Now we have to go back to the time of ne Nehemiah. Nehemiah, when he was governor of Jerusalem, closed the gates on a Sabbath so that there would be no what? No economic endeavors. 
right? No buying and selling. I want you to think typologically. No buying and selling. And the issue was what? Sabbath. That's what the issue was. But the nations around didn't take heed of what Nehemiah was doing, so they clamored for economic endeavors, and they parked their camel. It was a four-by-four four camel. <laughs> right in front of the gate. Eventually, Nehemiah came out and said, if you park your four-by-four four camel in front of the gate, I will give you a physical thrashing. Do you remember that? So he took a stand for what? No business transaction on the Sabbath day. And he pushed them out and he said, if anybody comes across this theoretical line and he drew a circle, I'll thrash you. And that came to be known as the holy area, the holy place around Jerusalem, free of any economic endeavor. Because there was always somewhere in Jerusalem a Jew who would sneak out and think that it was okay to go to McDonald's on a <laughs> Sabbath day. Of course, we wouldn't have something like that today. It wouldn't happen. <laughs> so this was the situation. It was an economic deal. So when you see the armies of Rome encompassing the city and setting up their standard in the holy place, uh, will this be an economic endeavor involving the Sabbath, yes or no? Is this stuff becoming interesting? I like typology. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones, for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Are you waiting for the siege? Which siege are you waiting for? The first one or the second one? The prophets to whom these great scenes were revealed longed to understand their import. They inquired and searched diligently, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister in these things. To us who are standing on the very verge of their fulfillment of what deep moment, what living interest are these delineations of the things to come. Events for which since our first parents turned their steps from Eden, God's children have watched and waited and longed and prayed. How close are we? And what is happening? So in other words, when the Romans laid siege on the city, they set up their standard or their banners upon which were depicted their pagan gods. And those standards were planted in the area around the city wall known as the Holy Ground. And uh, this is the fulfillment of what we read. In 1897... Ellen White writes a statement that modern-day fulfillment of this prophecy has already taken place. The Protestants have set up an idol, not will set up, have set up an idol Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be and they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. 
For this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places. When should they be moving out? Get out. In 1897, where are they sitting? Anywhere but out. So it will be again, but it is over the seventh day Sabbath that the battle will be thwarted. The authorities of this world will rise up in their pride and power and make laws to restrict religious liberty. They will assume a right that is God's alone. Even now they are making a beginning. 1898. Two sieges. Manuscript release, volume 10. The pressure of Sunday law has come and is coming. Wow. The decree enforcing the worship of this day is to go forth to all the world in a limited degree. It has already gone forth. 1897. Fascinating. The time has come when as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. Not the time will come. The time has come. Written in 1903. The children should be taken into the country. Now please, I'm not advocating a panic here. What does it say there? As God opens the way. The prophet Isaiah says, my people will not leave in haste. Don't stress. Do we serve a living God or do we serve a dead God? We must show the world that we recognize in the events that are now taking place in connection with the national reform movement the fulfillment of prophecy. That which we have for the last 30 years proclaimed would come is now here. So the movement involved in the first siege has already come. It's already gone. Remember 1 Corinthians, let all things be done decently and in order. No panic. Said the messenger of God shall win. Well, just recently, there were preachers in Europe preaching that of course we have to live in the cities because we have to preach in the cities. I'm not talking about the tail. I'm talking about the head. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. Where should God's people be living? According to the spirit of prophecy. Is this now mm, sensationalism? Is this fear talk or is this just reading the spirit of prophecy? It's just reading it, so no fear talk. And please understand, I don't live in the cities. I live outside on a farm. Do I live outside on a farm because I'm scared of my skin, of what will happen in the cities? No, I'm never on my farm. I'm always in the cities. The probability of being nabbed in a city is far greater for me than resting on my farm. But obedience requires that I do what God says and leave the consequences to him. So I'm not running away to save my hide. Why am I a health reformer? Because I want to be holier than the person next to me? Because I don't want to die at the age of 25 but want to reach at least 30? <laughs> no, because God said so. And if you do what God says, there are certain blessings that go along with it. And in any case, he did it for my lifestyle. Isn't that so? 
So our motive for why we do things should be in harmony with the Spirit of God. Year long, there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be able. If you switch on your televisions, do you see a possibility of something like that happening? Do you think the strife could spill over here with all the harvests failing in the world and all the great calamities? What do you think will happen if your supermarket shelves are suddenly empty? And it doesn't have to take three weeks. It can take one weekend and they will be empty, no matter how full they are. There are plenty of hungry people. We must be preparing for these issues. This is the light that is given. 1903. God will help his people to find such homes outside the cities. Make it an issue of prayer. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. Thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and thou shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. Jeremiah, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel. Behold, I will save thee from afar off and thy seed from the land of their captivity and Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease and none shall make him afraid. So this is not fear-mongering. I'm suggesting trust God and take him at his word. And if we trust God, there's nothing to be afraid of. Well, when was the first siege? The first siege was 1888. We all know the history when the Blair Bill came into existence to secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest, and to promote its observance as the day of worship introduced by Senator Blair of New Hampshire, May 21, 1888 referred to Committee on Education and Labor. Isn't that fascinating? You have a religious and an economic legislation. I like these little nuances, these little comparatives. Proposing an amendment to the Constitution of the United States respecting establishment of religion, etc., 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 it's fascinating that Alonzo Jones, the very righteousness by faith man, and that's a beautiful coupling too, managed with his beautiful speech to swing the legislature so that that law was not enacted. But already they were taking captive people and Seventh-day Adventists in the south of this great nation putting them into chain gangs and arresting them for transgression of the Sabbath laws. And then the siege passed away, first siege. The world was also ready to receive it because the great preachers like Moody, there was a great revival. We could have gone home, but because of unbelief, we were sent back into the desert. We are repeating the history of the children of Israel. This is the web page of the Lord's Day Alliance. That's their official web page. The Lord's Day Alliance of the United States was founded in 1888. Do you think this is all a coincidence? Somehow, I don't think so. That year, representatives of six major Protestant denominations met in Washington to organize the American Sabbath Union. This name was later changed to the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States. It has been one of the national organizations whose sole purpose is to maintain and cultivate the first day of the week as a time of rest, worship, Christian education, and spiritual renewal. That's their, their aim. And they've existed since 1888. Now, it's interesting to me that they write, 
that the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States exists to encourage Christians to reclaim the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, as a day of spiritual and personal renewal, enabling them to impact their communities with the gospel. In challenging, what? Economic times, like the world faces in 2009, the Lord's Day Alliance is seeking to uncover scriptural truths regarding the Ten Commandments combined with Jesus' teaching about money can provide guidance for Christians in their daily lives. Ah! The siege, Nehemiah, the holy place, Sabbath, economics, are we hearing the same sounds, yes or no? Okay. In 2001, when the Twin Towers fell in the United States of America, the Lord's Day Alliance sent out this statement. This is their chairman. We are keenly aware that we could not do our work without the financial support of our friends, so they're asking for money. It says 2001 is a watershed year. The national tragedy that occurred at September 11 in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania has changed our perspectives and frankly has caused even those who lack a spiritual thermometer to consider their faith, many for the first time in their life. We stand on the verge of an unprecedented opportunity to proclaim the message of the Christian Sunday in a manner unseen, at least in my lifetime. And then at the bottom of it, they have their address and their little statement. There's their address, and it says, Serving the churches and the nations since 1888. Now, it is these great truths we read in the book Education that old and young need to learn. We need to study the workings of God's purpose in the history of nations in the revelation of things to come, that we may estimate their true value, things seen and unseen. The day is at hand for the lesson to be learned, the work to be done, the transformation of character to be effected. The time remaining is but too brief a span. There's just a little bit of time here. Behold, they of the house of Israel say, the vision that he seeth is for many days to come. All these fear mongers talking about the end of time. The time is not far distant when the laws against Sunday lab labor will be more stringent and an effort should be made to se secure grounds away from the cities where fruits and vegetables should be raised. If the first siege is over, when will the second siege commence? Now, please note this statement. When the protection of human laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands a simultaneous movement for their destruction. So it's not just the United States. The United States will be the final enforcer, but in different lands there will be a simultaneous movement <laughs> to enact this kind of legislation. The world must be prepared to say, we want it. Second siege. I hear the rumbling of the Roman army. I can hear the wheels of this mighty army under the antitypical Titus returning for the second time. How close are we to the final events that we have been preaching about since our existence? Are we going to put it off and carry on sleeping, or are we there? Brussels, Belgium, February 16, 2009. By the way, what is the flag of the United uh, of the uh, European Union? It's blue with how many stars? 
12. Whose color is that? Mary. And doesn't she have 12 stars around her head in Roman Catholicism? The state is the Holy Roman Empire. Resurrected. How many kings did it have originally? Ten. Brussels, Belgium. The Secretariat of the Commission of the Bishops' Conference of the European Community has welcomed the proposed EU law that would safeguard Sunday as a day of rest from work, according to Osservatore Romano. That's the official mouthpiece of the Vatican. So in, 19, uh, so in 2009, the churches asked for a Sunday law to be enacted by the European Union. The European Union said no. They had a meeting and they said no. And the reason why they said no is they said it doesn't make any difference what day you rest, whether you rest on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, or Thursday, or any day. It doesn't matter as long as you get a day of rest. So go away, bishops. Just a few months later, December 23rd, 2009, Germany, the mightiest economic power in Europe, decides to ignore the decision of the European Parliament. Germany's High Court overturned the 2006 ruling that allowed Berlin shops to open for 10 Sundays per year, defaulting to stricter standards on weekend store openings. The decision to uphold a complaint from Protestant and Catholic churches that the opening went against Article 139 of the German Constitution, which states, Sunday and holidays recognized by the state shall remain protected by law as days of rest from work and of spiritual improvement. Labor, work, and church. Two aspects. So Germany goes it alone. Spiegel Online. Even atheists need to switch off on Sundays. Germany's highest court has ruled that Sunday should be kept as a day of rest and has overturned the Berlin law easing restriction on Sunday shopping. And now please take note. We have to read very carefully. My heart was strangely warmed <laughs> when I saw this article. Most German newspapers, now that is unprecedented. For all these years we've been preaching this and everybody said it would never happen. You wouldn't get the support. I mean, people love their sport. People love this. Forget it. The stores are all open now. Do you think we're going to go back to stricter rules? You're off the wall. You're insane with your stupid prophecy. That's what people were saying. But now note, most German newspapers on Wednesday greet the ruling. Some for reasons of religion and tradition, others out of concern for workers' rights. <laughs> How does my friend go? Something like that. The mark of the beast will be implemented where? On the forehead or the hand? So if you support it for reasons of religion and tradition, because it's not biblical, they are so perfect in their wording. Thank you, Spiegel. You couldn't have done it better had you quoted it from the Bible. Where will you receive it? In your forehead. But if you support it for reasons of workers' rights, where will you receive it? In the hand. Isn't this fascinating? Can you hear the rumbling of the Roman army? Now it's not just the churches. It's not just the religious body. Now it's the workers' unions that are asking for it. 
the labor unions had joined the churches in their campaign to ring fence Sunday as a day off for the nation. However, their focus was not on protecting the right to practice religion, but rather on protecting workers in the retail sector from having to work on Sundays. After all, the mark of the beast has to do in its implementation with buying and selling. Must be labor in action. Brilliant! Sunday is sometimes the only day when they might get to spend with members of the family, the servants, union, Verdi, greet a Tuesday ruling with relief and joy, saying this was a boon to shop workers and their families. German papers on Wednesday are broadly in favor of the ruling, though their reasons for supporting the court's decisions are striking different. This is reading prophecy and fulfillment. I love the little details. Abendzeitung. That's evening newspaper. Krisengipfel im Kanzleramt. Das Sonntagsgegacker. Isn't that a nice sentence for those who are German speaking? Crisis meeting of the top parliamentarians, including the Chancellor, Merkel, but they are gakan, talking on a Sunday. 2009, as you know, the economic crisis hit this planet, and the things got worse, and so on the 18th of January 2010, which was a year ago, these people could find no other time to set the agendas but on a Sunday. And so they gathered, she gathered with her top ministers just to set the agenda for the European Parliament's discussion. And guess what? The cardinal or the bishop of München freaked and he lambasted them on national television. This is the article. Beste Atmosphäre. It was a good atmosphere they were talking. But Reinhard Marx, the bishop, he refused to give his blessing to what they do. And this is what he said. Politiker sollten ein Zeichen setzen und sonntags keine Arbeitssitzungen abhalten. Wow. Sorry, I have to say it backwards. I forgot. All right, my heart was strangely warm. They must, politician, politicians must set a sign. What's the synonym of a sign? A mark. And should not have any meetings on a Sunday, said the top bishop furiously. Now, I'm always fascinated about relationships. Who is Reinhard Marx? Here's another one. Another newspaper saying exactly the same thing. There is Reinhard Marx, and he is the successor of Ratzinger in this bishop's post. So before him, the Pope had that position. And of course, he's wearing his purple and he's hugging the one in red. Now, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors and decked with gold and precious stuff. I can never leave it to just throw in a commercial. <laughs> Let's jump back to 2009 when the churches had asked for Sunday le legislation and it had been refused. 
It was the Church of England's House of Bishops, European panel, the Secretariat of Commerce, Commissé, Commission of the Catholics, Bishop Conference of the European Community and the Protestant Church in Germany, when they did this initiative to get Sunday legislation and called it an essential pillar of the European social model. We all know it was rejected. And uh, it was submitted by the following MEPs, and it gives the long list over here, and they say that it is, if you don't work on Saturday and Sunday, you have a 1.3 times greater chance of not getting sick, etc., etc. And the parliament said, listen, this is ludicrous. If you don't work on a Wednesday or a Thursday, you also wouldn't get that sick. So go away with your silly argument. And now they have some other arguments. Whereas, according to EU law, Sunday is the weekly rest day for children and adolescents. Oops. Now it gets serious. You see, in Europe, Sunday is the only day off for children. You go to school from Monday to Saturday. But Sunday is the day off. Now, what if we can change our argument and say, listen, European Parliament, you are destroyers of the family. You are against family values. Because if you give the mother off on a Wednesday and you give the father off on a Saturday, you are working on Sunday and your children are without supervision, without a family circle for that day of the week. And because the children are only free on a Sunday, the only logical day when the family should be together is that day. Therefore, your argument against us is not very valid, and we suggest you start rethinking it. And they quote the maxims and the texts and all of these things, and all of these church organizations that the council has failed to explain why Sunday as a weekly rest day is more closely connected with the health and safety of workers than any other day. That decision of yours, you, European Parliament, is not valid. Rethink your position. After all, more than any, any other day of the week, a free Sunday gives you an opportunity to meet the family. The kids are there. And more than any other day of the week, a free Sunday offers the opportunity to meet friends and establish and maintain social ties. More than any other day of the week, it gives you an opportunity to pursue your spiritual needs. More than any other day of the week, thereby promoting family health, you will promote social health, more, etc., etc. Are the arguments becoming better, yes or no? They're becoming better. In, be in fact, they're becoming conclusive. They're going to win. I'll show you why. So on March the 24th, 2010, they reopened the debate in the European Parliament. But this time, not just the churches. And uh, the European parliamentarians and the churches and the other organizations clubbed together and they started protection of a work-free Sunday. And this was the webpage at European Parliament. And now, these are all the church affiliates. These are church groups that are associated with this drive, 2010. These are all the civil societies those are the ones that want to promote family well-being. All those are involved and all these trade unions. Any one of them by itself could stop a country's economic activity if they striked. First it was the churches. Now we have the churches, the civil societies, and the trade unions. 
Can you hear the rumbling of the Roman army coming to besiege us the second time? Uh, just a close-up to show you how many of these labor unions are involved, and they're massive, massive labor unions. Zenit, that's the official Roman Catholic newspaper. The European Parliament is stubborn. It says, not enough. We want your vote. One million citizens needed to request day for children. Give us a million signatures from Europe and it's a done deal. That's nothing. That's nothing. Strasbourg, March 17, Martin Kassler, a German member of the European Parliament, launched the first citizen refer referendum of the European Union to request that Sunday be declared a day for family and rest. Wow. Oh, I forgot, sorry. Immediately there were over 11,000 signatures. And Kassler affirmed that the initiative will strengthen direct democracy in the European Union. Now it's an issue of labor, it's an issue of civil societies, it's an issue of the churches, it's an issue of the people, and it has become a democratic principle. Thanks to the Lisbon Treaty and the introduction of the European Citizens Initiative, we as European citizens for the first time get the opportunity to stand up for our concerns. We want to use this opportunity to ensure a free Sunday. And we want it now. Get involved. Get involved. And they open up web pages. The work-free Sunday is part of our European culture. We need a time for our families. Family becomes an issue. For civil society, for religion, a full working days is unlikely to be fulfilling. Rallying together, the press release noted that Kassler joined with four other deputies last year to introduce to the European Parliament a written declaration regarding the work-free Sunday. The required quota for parliamentary members was not present, but 261 deputies did sign the declaration. He expressed hope that the people from different political and social backgrounds can rally behind Sunday protection. He added every single person and organization all over Europe is welcome to support the first European Citizens Initiative, and so it carries on. And the web page is www.free-sunday.eu. Check it out. And push, show all signatures, and watch it go. <laughs> Can you hear the rumbling of the Roman army? Sundays, Daddy and Mommy belong to us. Are they getting clever? Get the kids involved. Dear Europeans, we want it. Sunday is Children's Day. Sunday, Daddy and Mommy belongs to us. There is no day like Sunday. It's not a day like any other. The momentum is swelling. Here are the parliamentarians and the pastors and the evangelicals and the uh, Lutheran church and the organizations and they're coming together and they're asking for this. Now let's go to the spirit of prophecy. It was written in 1888. A time is coming when the law of God in a special sense is to be made void in our land. It must come in the United States. She will be the final enforcer. After all, she is the leader of the Protestant world. It is fitting that it must be the United States and not Europe. Europe it has, has had its reformation and its war, but Protestantism is embodied in the United States as the leader of the Protestant world. It's when the Protestant world and the Protestant leader turns its back on the law of God 
that the final fulfillment will come. She will be enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath. In other words, it cannot only be a Sunday law. It must also be an anti-Sabbath law. Right? Pharaoh said, You, Moses, make the people rest. Get ye to your burdens. That was an anti-Sabbath keeping law. Rest, you Moses, make the people Shabbat, keep the Sabbath. Constantine made a Sunday law. He said you will rest on Sunday. But the Roman Catholic Church in 321 made an anti-Sabbath law and said Christians shall not Jewardize. They shall work on that day, but the Lord's day they shall honor. So it's very simple. If you're going to close all the shops on a Sunday, will there be an economic outcry from the labor section, yes or no? Yes. How about telling them everybody has to work? on a Saturday, whole day, not half day. Let's double the time in the week when you can work. And let's introduce more shifts because there are so many people who are without jobs. We can employ more people, but you will be forced to work. In the malls of this world, you may have Sunday closure, but it is illegal in most malls in the world to close on a Saturday. The law is already in place. To secure popularity, prophets and kings, and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for Sunday law so that the law doesn't come according to the statement from the top. The law comes from where? From the bottom. Demand. We had the churches demanding it. It was refused. We had the churches and the labor unions and the civil societies asking for it. It was still refused, not implemented. Now they say, give us signatures. Are they going to refuse when that comes? And the fulfillment is just about there. And some countries have unilaterally implemented. You can check all the web pages. And this is the man driving it, Thomas Mann. And Vatican Radio, EU initiative for a free Sunday, is thrilled with him and sings his praises. Surely the secular Britons won't get in on this debate. Let's listen to the BBC. Let's get some sound. Mondays used to be a very different day to uh, the Sundays. rest of the week. One day we could all relax, we could see friends and family, we could go to church. It's all changed. Should the Sabbath be a day of rest? We, I mean, Christina, we've, we've gone beyond the point of, uh, of return on this, haven't we? I mean, you know, here you are, you've got a deadline for tomorrow, you've got to write an article, you've got to appear on a wonderful television program on a Sunday morning. It's just, it's not the way we live now, is it? No, but wouldn't it be nice if the government sent us a message that they didn't think of us only as units of consumption and, bees. and production and yeah. worker bees. Yeah. Just once in a week, we were let off the hook and we could not shop and we could not work and, uh, and actually concentrate on, on the other, on the whole self. On each other. And on each other. Why not? Wouldn't it be nice if government sent us a message just once a week that we are not units of consumption, worker bees, cannot shop? Blair Court's controversial U.S. pastor, Rick Warren, in Bed to Unite Faiths. There's union and working behind the scenes on this issue. Pope calls for a new world order. Pope Benedict has proposed a new world political authority with real teeth. 2009. Then, 
2010, Obama to seek new international order. Obama is fading criticism for his declaration over the weekend that he would seek a new international order. Kissinger said this president has a real chance to introduce the new world order. And he made his speech at the military academy. Fascinating. Fascinating. The president added that the efforts by American armed forces need to be complemented with greater diplomatic engagement from grand capitals to dangerous outposts, more humanitarian assistance to needy nations, better communications amongst intelligence agencies, etc. First responses to all of these things. I'm not going to repeat my total onslaught lectures, but whether you are a Republican or whether you are a Democrat, it doesn't matter. You sit at the feet of the Knights of Malta. You sit at the feet of the Knights of Malta. You shake the hand of the Templars. Now, I know that he didn't write it, and you've all read this, but I just want to bring it into the story. It's on his webpage, so it must have been vetted and left there. Not written by him, not by Obama, but the blog is there. It plants a seed. There have been a lot of changes in the past hundred years. Not only have we seen gang activity increase along with crimes, but so has energy consumption. The other change I realized was the rescinding of Sunday laws across the United States. So perhaps we should consider enacting a Sunday law not to restrict people from working, but to give liberty to those who can't choose. May 22, 2010, Pope calls for solidarity on the world's finances. <clears throat> Says ethics must guide all actions. What ethics must be introduced? What law favoring the first beast must be introduced in political grounds? On the same day that Obama called for a new international order to solve the challenges of our times, Benedict also called for international cooperation, particularly in the area of solidarity guided by ethics. I love his two hand signs. Now, 2010. 26-9, 2010. Pontiff wants families to start preparing for the 2012 event. Wow. What does that mean? The German pontiff made this request on August 23, letter to the president of the Pontifical Council for the Family. The theme for the upcoming Seventh World Meeting of Families is family, work, and celebration. Celebration is always an issue of worship. So we have work and celebration. We have the mark of the beast on the hand and on the forehead, one of the two. The Holy Father's letter reflected on these themes. Work and celebration are intimately connected to the life of the families. They condition choices, influence relations between married couples, between parents and children, affect the relations of families with society and with the church. The pontiff noted the Holy Scripture tells us that the family, work, and the feast days are gifts and blessings of God to help us to live a fully human existence. There's a minefield of information in that statement. So here the Pope is asking for preparation for 2012 to have work and feast days incorporated. Why? So that you could have a fully human existence. Now we have to just harken back to Vatican II where salvation was defined as having a fully human existence. In other words, you are not saved by Christ through grace. 
You are saved from your miserable existence by the papacy, by giving you the kingdom of earth, or kingdom of heaven here on this earth, where they want to assume their millennial reign. That's what he's saying. And he's saying it is at hand. And it is fascinating that this Pope was not enthroned as Pope wearing the triple triara. He chose, like his predecessors, from Vatican I, uh, from Vatican II, sorry, Pope John Paul the Pope Paul VI laid aside the tiara, which means ruler of the underworld, heaven, and earth, the totality of temporal and spiritual power. He laid it aside, and he put only the turban on his head, which was a symbol of his spiritual supremacy, gathering the churches together under one blanket after 1962. But this year, in January, for the first time he unfurled the triple tiara from his window in Rome when he gave his speeches. What is he saying? He's saying, not only have I now the spiritual power, I am unfurling my temporal power. All power will be given unto the beast. Let's see how far he goes. In this light, Benedict lamented the modern organization of work in function of market competition and maximizing profit and the concept of rest or celebration as an occasion for escape and consumption. He said both these factors contribute to the breakup of the family. Now where did we hear this? Is this coming out of the blue or has there been a preparatory groundwork at parliamentary level, yes or no? Can you hear the rumbling of the wheels of the Roman army with its artillery coming towards us? Spell it out for us, Benny. Thus the Pope continued, it is necessary to promote, I have two favorite Bennies, Benedict and Benny Hinn. <laughs> Both wear white. <laughs> it is necessary to promote reflection and efforts at reconciling the demands and the periods of work with those of the family and to recover the true meaning of the feast, especially on Sunday, the East, weekly Easter, the day of the Lord and the day of man, the day of the family, of the community and of solidarity. Is he asking for Sunday legislation in preparation for 2012, yes or no? Which means he's asking for it to be prepared in which year? Are we going home? Are we going home? Let's see. It is my wish, and please note, this is zenit.org. This is Catholic source. It is my wish, therefore, that already in the course of 2011, the 30th anniversary of the apostolic exhortation, of Familiaris Consortio, the great charter of family pastoral care, might be taken as a valid guide with initiatives at the parish, diocese, and national level, aimed at throwing light on experience of the work and celebration in their truest and most positive aspects, with particular regard to the effect of, on the concrete life of the families. And this time, the wheels will not return, because this is the second siege. Typologically, this is it. Brothers and sisters, the time is here. We are going home. 
Ezekiel 39, 6 to 8, And I will send a fire on my Gog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Where are we as a church? Are we ready for this, or are we in a great Omega apostasy. And what will happen to us? Where does judgment start? Judgment starts with the house of God. And there will be a mighty shaking. And there will be a spitting out. Not a coming out. Get loose. As I have said, sit in this church. This is God's church. It's going through. How it goes through, with all the planks intact, we'll look at that in another lecture. But the fact of the matter, this is God's church. This is the message that was entrusted to the pioneers. This is the message that will be preached to the end. Whether some wish to, destroy the message, make it of none effect, or give an alternative message, that's not our business. Do what is right and leave the consequences to God. Behold, it is come and it is done, says the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. Revelation 21, 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountains of water and of life freely. And that's what I have to tell you tonight. The Roman army is approaching. And this time, it will not return. What are the consequences? Don't flee, because fleeing comes later. Pray for God to open the way as you see fit. And give your heart to God and ask him, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? Not to save my skin, but to save the skin of others so that many can be called to righteousness. May God bless you as you contemplate these things. Amen.